Picture Venice, a beautiful city rich with history that's constantly facing a major problem with water. Seasonal flooding can make it difficult to get around. It threatens cultural sites like San Marco Square and leaves a serious mess behind. And someday Boston could be in a similar boat. Climate change is expected to cause sea levels to rise by as much as two feet. And unless major steps are taken, many of Boston's historical treasures could be lost. WGBH News reporter Rupa Shinoy has this focus report. Boston is an old city, rich with history, from Old North Church to the Charlestown Navy Yard to the Paul Revere House. Helping look after all these historical sites is the city's archaeologist, Joe Bagley. Um, and we're actually in Fannel Hall right now, which is one of the more popular sites that we have in the city of Boston, but it's also one of the lowest sites. The building and surrounding Quincy Market stand only a few feet above sea level. That's because, as Bagley shows me on some maps inside, Faneuil Hall was built in the 1740s on top of what had been Boston's original waterfront. The building that we're in, which is Faneuil Hall, is located right on the southern part of Town Dock. And Town Dock was um, an existing open bay right on the shore of Boston that was used in the 1630s for all of the merchants and all the imports coming into Boston. But as Boston grew, so did the need for land. People used trash and fill to create new land, including the site on which Faneuil Hall was built. And that trash is now archaeological gold. Everything in this case is about 200 to 300 years old and represents some of the earliest history of Boston. Even though this is a small example of what we actually have gotten from the site, because the site fills up about 100 boxes, you can imagine that this is what you'd find for nearly a quarter mile in that direction, underneath all of the buildings of Quincy Market. But these low-lying areas are also among the most vulnerable to flooding, from storm surge caused by coastal storms like Hurricane Sandy, or from gradually rising sea levels caused by climate change. The Boston Harbor Association warns that Faneuil Hall and much of the city could be below sea level by 2050. Eventually, these sites are going to be underwater if we don't take action to either document them, get them out of the way, or protect them. That's a conversation the city is just beginning, protecting historical buildings with the rain of possible options, including seawalls, canals, and man-made lagoons. But Bagley's worried about artifacts that remain buried. There's so much more to the history of Boston that we just don't see um, that's either below ground or just secondary to the big sites that everybody knows about. Those lesser-known sites include a wealth of Native American artifacts on the Boston Harbor Islands. They're some of the best Native sites in New England, but because they're on the Harbor Islands, they're not that uh, they're not the center of focus of what's happening. And Bagley Bagley says right now the city doesn't have enough time or money to save everything. He says all we can do is prioritize what we want to save. It's really about the stories that these artifacts tell about the people of Boston, whether it be yesterday or 3,000 years ago. Rupa Shinoy, WGBH News. So how can Boston protect its historical treasures from the threat of rising tides? We're joined by Julie Wormser. She is the executive director of the Boston Harbor Association, and we're so glad you could be with us Thank tonight. You. Thanks for joining us. So I pose that question to you. How do we save our historical treasures? Wow, it's a great question. <laughs> and a tough one, I know. Well, it's interesting. I mean, Boston's going to have to change, right? But it doesn't have to be worse. I think that's the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. The Dutch, and they know water, right? Mm -hmm. They, um, after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans said, you know what, dikes can burst, levees can break, we right. need to do something different. And what they started doing is something called living with water. How can we let the water in, in managed ways, mm -hmm. to protect mm -hmm. those things we cherish that would be ruined by salt water? Imagine having Boston having a sapphire necklace to go with its emerald necklace. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, very interesting. Mm. We have this map, I wanna take a look at yeah. this. Let's look at this together, Julie, because I think you can sort of explain this. I, I know we had it in our story, but now the magenta area is what? So this is a map of what Boston would look like with high tide plus another seven and a half feet of water. Now we're not gonna see this today. We have a very, very protective harbor but we're looking at six feet of sea level rise right. by the year 2100, so by the end of the century. So we could see this kind of flooding every single year. That magenta is four feet of flooding. Um, so maybe that would be a surge, right? Could that, could that possibly be a storm well, surge kind of thing? You know, a lot of that actually would be flooded with the tide, it honestly. Would, right. But if you look at that map, if you're a Boston historian, that's our original coastline. 
So that's yeah. really the sea reclaiming its own. Right. Um, so some of that is from storms, some of that's just simply from the tide. All right, let's bring Nancy. This is Nancy George. She, she wants to speak. I know she's anxious <laughs> to get in. She's the commissioner of the Boston Environmental Department. It's nice to see you. Nice Thank you see for you coming in. Well, first off, let's just talk about what, what, what are we really talking about when we talk about depths and what we could anticipate, Nancy? Well, the, we feel very confident in the science that climate change exists, and sea level rise has been predicted to be anywhere between three and six feet by the end of 2001, as Julie has mentioned. But we're really looking at two to three feet by 2050, and we're really trying to get the city to plan and think about the eventuality that we will have water to live with. So we were just talked about living with water. Right. Mm -hmm. Explain to everyone a little bit more, ladies, about what that would mean. I mean, it, it sort of means like canals and that kind of thing, right? It could mean canals. It could mean having to deal with twice daily floods or peaks. We have to look at areas where we have lower, we have, we have some neighborhoods that are very exposed, mm -hmm. like East Boston, like right. Morrissey Boulevard, or looking at Long Wharf. And you look at some of the tides that have come in with some of the storms. When you see the tide has covered over the wharf, people mm -hmm. need to realize that that could be an eventuality that they would face. But I think making a distinction between living in water and wading through water, which is no fun, <laughs> and actually, <laughs> actually designing the city so water could be beautiful. Uh -huh. So think about right. Amsterdam with its canals. Sure. What if there were side streets in Boston that could become canals to keep the other streets dry for longer? Sure. Imagine having beautiful water um, features in open spaces. So it's a dry park um, mm -hmm. during dry times and in times of flooding or even the tide, it fills up with water but does no harm. Right. So right. a salt marsh is inundated twice a day without harm. We can make the city um, be able to manage much more water without harm, but we have to plan for it. Listen, I mean, it sounds like a terrific idea, but to me, immediately, I see dollar signs. Where would we get the money mm -hmm. to, to plan in such a way and then to actually implement it? It's interesting you say that because right now the city is planning. They're doing the update of their climate action plan, and that is an update of the plan that was created in 2011, and that plan will be complete by the end of the year there will be recommendations that accompany some of the strategies that people are thinking about. Mm -hmm. And frankly, they, there will have to be public-private partnerships mm -hmm. in order to accomplish some of the strategies that we want to achieve. For example, the city already has a private partnership with the Green Ribbon Commission, mm -hmm. which are some of the leading businessmen and industries and educational institutions and hospitals in the city who came together to basically advise Mayor Menino mm -hmm. on climate change. These people understand that they have a responsibility because of the buildings that they own, the, man the institutions they manage, or the schools that they run. Right. Very right. important. They have enormous amounts of square footage that has to be considered in terms of how they're going to lower their emissions. But Julie, we have a tendency to be a reactionary mm. society versus doing something preventative. So mm -hmm. can, can we get people really to, to get out there and understand this is a real issue and to raise that money? I think, I think New York took one for the team in Hurricane Sandy. So it wasn't that far off right. from us. And really, if Hurricane Sandy had hit at high tide mm -hmm. instead of low tide, we would have seen a 100-year flood. Mm -hmm. What people know less is that three times since, and I know you live on the water and you've been seeing a lot of flooding, right. three times since we similarly missed 100-year floods in 18 months just by the low tide, high tide cycle. So as people are seeing a little more flooding, as people are seeing flooding nearby, it's not such a far off thing that people imagine. And you know um, from all the no news stories you've done, it is cheaper to prevent mm. than to recover from devastation. Absolutely. Including all that you lose in terms of lost productivity. Sure. You know, lost treasures. Well, and that's just it. I mean, we're talking about treasures that we couldn't replace regardless. That's right. Absolutely. And, that, and that's a really difficult. Will we have to sacrifice? Will we have to sacrifice some? Can we protect them all? I, Hard you know, in a city like this one. I, I think we're going to have to make priorities. Mm -hmm. And I frankly think that we're going to have to look at certain things. We certainly have to talk to people who are proposing new buildings now and say, there's a better way to do it. Right. You need to be more right. adaptive. You need to put your mechanicals on the top. You need to look at the model that the Spalding Rehab Hospital mm -hmm. gave us in terms of making it useful 
And as Julie says, you want it to be productive and you want it to be able to, res to respond quickly so that people and tenants and businesses are not out of business as long as they were in New York. Mm. Nancy and Julie, thank you both. This is a fascinating, really mm. fascinating subject that affects us all. It, it does. really, really does. Well, thank thank you. you both very much for your insight. We appreciate it.